and welcome to the Healthcare Facilities Network. I am your host, Peter Martin, president of Gosselin Martin Associates. As always, thank you for clicking on this video. Today's video is uh, episode three of Filling the Pipeline, as were our past episodes. This episode of Filling the Pipeline is also a two-parter. We have a new group of guests for you today. We have Jim Hogel, we have Ryan Gagnon, and we have Jordan Smith. It's an interesting crew of three. They, uh, they all come from different demographics. Jim is the elder statesman of the group. Um, so Jim, if you're the elder statesman of this group, I guess I would be too, because Jim and I are the same age. So Jim's the elder statesman, most experienced out of the group. Ryan is at the other end of the spectrum. He's the, uh, the young guy of the group, and he calls himself the young guy in the, uh, in the video you're about to watch. So, uh, We'll call Ryan the young guy for this intro, intro, and then we have Jordan Smith, who is in the middle, relative, roughly, to the, to the age. So, different perspectives that are offered. You know, Jim talks a little bit about how the, the field has changed from, you know, 30, 35 years ago. Both Jim and Ryan went to Maritime Academies, um, but the years of experience is a little bit different. So we have episode one where we talk a little bit about the finance aspect of it. We talk about speaking the language of the CFO. Uh, we talk about changes in the field, and it's a very interesting conversation. And then episode two, we talk a little bit more about um, you know the issues that are plaguing the field today relative to you know finding employees. We pick episode, we pick part two off with with Jordan talking about his unique approach to finding and hiring for facilities management and then Ryan jumps in Ryan uh, began as an intern and so Ryan in the story you're about to hear or that you will hear in part two he echoes what we've talked about a couple of times on the healthcare facilities network as an intern Ryan began working in hospitals his freshman year and we have heard numerous times on this channel that one of the keys to filling that pipeline with younger folks is getting them when they're early or when they're early in their college career. And certainly that was the case with Ryan. He started his freshman year, and he interned all four years in college. And so all three of them in episode two talk about the uniqueness of this role. So this is an interesting conversation. I like both parts of it are a little bit, uh, a little bit different. And so my thanks to my three guests, who I will introduce in the upcoming video. So this introduction uh, will serve for both uh, part one and part two of episode three of Filling the Pipeline. The, uh, the terminology to name these shows reminds me a little bit of kind of those 1970s, uh, 1970s detective series that you would have seen. I, I see them occasionally on your uh, TV land or your, your older channel, uh, your older channels on your cable TV. So anyways, Maybe you don't have cable. Maybe you're a millennial and you, you've ditched cable. Um, you probably have. So that's why we have these discussions about filling the pipeline. And so with that, Peter Martin from Gosselin Martin Associates and the Healthcare Facilities Network, I hope you enjoy both episodes of Filling the Pipeline. Thanks. Jordan, for I know you, know, you and I um, spoke before, and you were just talking about empowering your team to take some of the burden off. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to hiring team member team members and bringing them along i mean we talk about lack of folks not only at a management level but at the trade level as well can, can you talk people through kind of your hiring approach and what you look for and and how you handle that process yeah so you know again i'm looking for i'm looking for people and their individual skill sets that i can't teach right you know that's you know, I tell people you can teach a, mon a monkey to turn wrenches, right? Mm -hmm. But but there there's intangibles that you can't teach. So how do you deal with people? How is your communication skills? How are you know what what previous history that you, did you have? You know, I have a facility manager that you know I, when I hired her to be a project coordinator for construction, she was selling she was selling commercial vehicles to contractors, mm -hmm. right? Working for the Chevy dealer, selling commercial vehicles to contractors. And I said, if you can explain the features and benefits of a commercial vehicle to a construction guy, you can go up here and sell my my construction projects to nurse managers, right? I mean, and she had a degree in construction management, so she wasn't she wasn't starting from scratch, 
but but again, it, it's looking for the intangibles of hey, what are you doing, and and how can I turn that into into what I need to accomplish? Not necessarily looking for that resume of somebody that's been uh, has hospital experience for three, four, five, six years. Either either those per people are going to be looking to advance to the next position, mm -hmm. or or they're um, they're going to be set in their ways and and not not a good fit for the organization, right? So it it might not work that way all the time, but you have to be a little bit more open and receptive and and think outside the box to hey, what am I trying to accomplish with this with this position? What is this? What are the tasks that these people need to do, and what are the skill sets, uh, and and who would be a good fit for those skill sets? Do you so when you hire that way, when you use that um, that process, and I know I'm asking you to do a typical thing, but relative to training them up, bringing them along, is that completely on you? Do you do you utilize a team to bring them along? I mean, once you you got them on, which is a great thing. Now, what's your next step to get them where you need them to be? So I lean heavily on our trade organizations. You know, ASHI is a big one. We have a big state chapter of ASHI, the Florida Healthcare Engineering Association. We get together every other month and we have continuing education classes. Uh, we have conferences twice a year at the state level that, you know, we we bring in we bring in joint commission experts, right? We get Jim Kendig come in and, and give a presentation on you know, the latest codes and standards, then we have, we have, the state is very highly regulated for healthcare. So we have those state inspectors come in and give education. And so they're, so I lean heavily on those for the, for the, for the high level knowledge of, Hey, this is what we're doing in the background. Um, but again, I'm, I'm looking for that personality to say, Hey, you, I can teach you the codes and the standards, but, but I can't teach you how to, how to work with people. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at the, um, when you look at the technical versus the soft skill or the technical versus the leadership skills, how do you assess the what you're looking for as a, as a um, mix between the two? Um, references, a lot of these people that I'm that you know I'm looking for outside the role that I bring into a, a hospital engineering type role. Um, it, it's usually because I know somebody that knows them or it's um, you know I've got an insight on those um, that, that's it's it's hard to do that with a cold resume yes right if, if you're just taking a piece of paper and looking at somebody you have no idea on a personality fit you know if you're trying to do a zoom interview you know thankfully we've gotten a little bit away from those again but you know it, it's just hard to pick up on those things and even if you're sitting down face to face for one hour it's hard to pick up on those things uh but my most successful hires have been through you know contacts relationships referrals from people that i know and trust you know even if it's second third fourth tier Hey, I'm looking for somebody. Does anybody know? You know, I hired an EBS director, and it was from an and I got the referral from my infection control nurse who knew another infection control nurse who <laughs> knew this EBS director that thought they would be a good fit, right? And so that's and and he's wildly he's going to be wildly successful for our organization. Um, and but that's that's the best pipeline to to get folks. Pretty competitive market down there these days. It is. It is. There's incredible. We have a lot of population growth, so there's a lot of a lot of new jobs, and there's a lot of competition for talent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jordan, I mean Jordan. Sorry, Ryan. I'm talking about entries into healthcare facilities management. We mentioned it at the beginning. You're Mass Maritime graduate. Did you? Were you an intern first? Did you intern before? Uh, you started on your path. And if you interned first, how did you find out? Did, were you at Leahy? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, I started Maritime as a marine engineering degree. And within about three months, I realized I had no intention of shipping out and happened to have a friend of a friend who worked at, um, whose father worked at Leahy in the ORs and went down and spoke with um, the current director, uh, who was also at Mass Maritime. And he offered to have you know bring me in and and uh, the acquaintance uh, as interns. Um, I was only a freshman at Mass Maritime. Usually, don't get internships till yeah. junior senior year. Yeah. Um, Is that Paul Cantrell? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Everyone knows Paul Cantrell. Um, Love Paul. <laughs> yeah. So Paul brought us in, uh, and you know we had two a year. And although I wasn't getting school credit for him, it was a summer and winter job for me and an opportunity to learn. Um, so I kept going back, um, 
I ended up doing six or seven internships just at Leahy. Wow. And, you know, positions got moved around, new director came in, worked with him for a while. And by the time I graduated, there was talk of, hey, we might have a manager position open if you would be interested in it. Um, and I was, but it, it, if I hadn't been there doing internships for the three years, yeah, it wouldn't have been an opportunity. Um, and to touch base on, you know, students out of, I know you talk about Mass Marathon, just because my history and everything, I think they have a great program. Sure. Um, those students coming out and getting offers, you know, five, six, seven offers. And I was the same way. It's just that I already had an in, I knew the building and I knew the folks there and I liked it. Um, but I was getting offers for more money than I, than I started out as, and as a, you know, student come out of college, you, one of your biggest thoughts is money. Yeah. Especially, you know, right now people under 26 can stay on their parents' insurance. They don't, don't care about health benefits. Right. They don't care about that stuff. Yep. They're, they're hearing money and time off and work-life balance. Um, so I find that to be a struggle. And, and I, I think a way to get people in is bring them in earlier. I mean, we, we rely on, maritime and whatnot up here for interns in junior and senior year but if we can even get them earlier than that even if it doesn't count for credit i mean you gotta pay them um so so pete did just to piggyback on that i think one of the things that we do poorly you know jim jim spoke about learning the language of finance right i think we also need to learn the language of hr right <laughs> and we need to learn you know job architecture and and how how we're setting up our programs right how do you bring people in at an entry level both for management and a technical level right it's, yeah. it's how do I grow somebody from a tech one and make them a tech two and a tech three? And what's that process look like? You know, are they, are they, does that evolve around industry certifications? You know, I don't know. I mean, it's, but each organization needs to kind of map that out. So, so people have an opportunity to come in at an entry level and to continue to grow and to continue to feel good about themselves and think that, Hey, I've got a career here. You know, I can see this pathway. I know what yeah. I'm going to be doing two, five, 10 years from now. And, and I know that this is worthwhile to hang in there and, and do this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons people leave, right? They don't see, they don't see that pathway up to, not everybody wants it, but those who do, they're looking for it. Were you going to say something, Ryan? I think something that plays into it massively too, is us as leaders and directors and, and current managers is also being a mentor for these students and young folks coming in. Um, and I, I was lucky I had that. And that's the reason I am where I am today. But if you bring in, there's a place that bring in interns and I did one of them and it was, you know, do closeout binders for the next three months and you're not being mentored and you're not learning and, and not being brought into the space until you graduate. And then all of a sudden they're calling you saying they need to come work and it's go dig a ditch. Right. <laughs> and you have a sour taste in your mouth because that's what you feel like the work is. And I, so I think uh, as leaders and, you know, being mentors for the younger folks and giving them an opportunity to learn uh, is huge. And I think it falls on the current directors and, and above and whatnot to, you know, take that role um, where I think, and not to speak for everyone that's in the industry, but I think for a while there was a mentality of protecting, you know, your job, they'd be in that job until they retire. And there was a huge mentality of protecting it and keeping the information. And I, I think it's starting to shift away from that, but you still see it. I think the internships are, are, are a lot of key to, you know, survival, you know, for us, you know, bringing the young people in to really understand um, the roles that we're doing. And, and I think that they, and I think HR, um, I mean, we absolutely do it with nursing, they do it with medicine, right? They, these are, these are, because um, mm -hmm. we're in their industry, right? we're a support to their industry. So that's, you know, we're not the industry, right? So, mm -hmm. so realizing that in order to support that industry, um, we really have those same basic tenants that we have to utilize. And they're already there. You know, I've spoken to HR just this morning. We're discussing, I've got, you know, um, one of my directors is going crazy because his boiler operators are leaving for more money and they're going to farm or they're going to colleges and substantially. I mean, you know, if guy's making $45 an hour with, with us, he's making $65 an hour for the same job, you know, and, and then he's getting the money on the back end for his pension and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, we're not only competing with, healthcare, we're competing with other industries for skilled trades and so on. You know, I, I don't, I, I don't typically get in the level, um, this point in my career with the skilled trade, you know, guys who are, are working across, it's really the directors that we hire, but then, and, and, and Peter knows we have may have a different view of what I, I view of a director of engineering and, and, yeah. and what other people do, you know, we have a very, very, um, 
a, a kind of a stringent, maybe maybe parochial way of looking at directors engineering. Um, there's the soft skills that Jordan, you know, you got to be able to talk to people and you know that, but also I believe that they need these technical skills in order because you are the director of engineering. <laughs> You, yeah. you you need those technical skills that you need to be able to resolve problems, you know, and biggest problems when you come into construction, you got to understand what they're they're saying to you, you know, and understand that what a drawing looks like and, you know, what what are you trying to get out of this construction job? So we have a very, um, most people consider a very difficult process to hire a director of engineering. It's not easy. Um, we do ask very technical questions, you know, because I am an engineer, you know, and, and I'm going to ask you questions and some are, but we all have strengths and weaknesses, right? You know, so we kind of talk about, look, if you're not an electrical guy and you're a mechanical guy, you know, we'll, we accept that. <laughs> but, I, but I think that bringing interns in and, but we have the format. I keep telling people that nursing and, and medicine, they have these, they have the, 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 the trails to follow. This isn't new yeah. um, to, to anybody. It was, um, I was uh, yesterday. I was at um, I was at an orientation for one of my children who, who's going to school next year, and I just happened to be talking to. There was a doctor there, and we just struck up a conversation. And he is a doctor at a place that I know pretty well. And it was interesting. You know, he he said to me, he was saying, you know, I look at the facility now versus what it was ten years ago. And he's like, when I walk in now, the grass is overgrown, the landscaping you know, the landscaping stinks, it looks dingy. And, and, you know, he said, years ago, you could pay somebody and he, and he wasn't being critical. He's like, you could exist on a $45,000 a year salary, and you took pride in your work, and you were invested in the community, and your children were born in the hospital. And he's like, so you felt, you know, you took ownership and pride as you walked in. And he's like, I'm not, and he's like, that's all kind of changed now. And it's not, you know, I'm not making a, a a comment. I guess I'm making a comment on society, but but that's really true. And all of this goes into you hiring people, right? Jimmy, you just talked about a guy going from 45 to 65 bucks. Who would say, no, don't do it, right? I mean, you could, you, you would never, right? But it's just, you guys are dealing with all of these issues on top of, on top of a, um, a population that's retiring, right? So that's just another thing that you have to deal with especially more so up in the Northeast where the cost of living is, it's exorbitant, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not an easy issue to. And, and, and it's funny, even with the money, you know, the men and women who leave really like where they work. It's, yeah. you know, like the environment, you know, Ryan, Jordan, I mean, like the, just the environment of healthcare, you know, helping patients and helping people, mm -hmm. they really like it, you yep. know, and, and some really are struggling with the leave, but when, you know, when food's up 10% from last year and your kid's college is up 10%. Yes. You know, you're, you're, you're sitting and go, I got to go. Right. You, you, you know, <laughs> well, that's, and, and that's, and that's difficult. The, that's one of the advantages of our industry, right? Is, is we, we give people, especially with the new generation coming up, right? We give people a sense of purpose, right? You, mm -hmm. you are working towards something with your career, right? You're not, if you go work for an engineering agent uh, company and you know, you're, you're drawing plans all day and, and you're, you're trying to increase value for shareholders. Uh, it's not the same kind of purpose, right? But, but I get to go make sick people better every day. And, and I, I come to work every day and I go home every day knowing that, Hey, I, I made a difference with my efforts. Right. And so that's, that's something, and maybe you can get that from a school and a university and, um, you know, but it's, it doesn't, it doesn't translate to every industry. No, that purpose and passion doesn't. Um, and, you know, we'll find that sometimes people who go to education or academia, they get bored. I mean, and, and I'm only saying that because I hear it from them. They kind of want to jump back in because they lost the adrenaline and the purpose and, and the passion. But for some, it's that bottom line, you know, if I can make 20 bucks more an hour without the stress level of healthcare, then I'm going to do it. Guys, um, coming to the end rapidly. So I just want to, um, I, I want to throw a, a final question out there and I hope we can have another discussion because when you plug through all of this stuff, it's the, the, there's a lot that you've covered. But one of the things um, I, I got a, I received an article, somebody sent it to me, Beth Edwards from HFM Cornerstone. She has a small consulting firm out in the West Coast, not a small consulting firm, but she sent me an article that she saw in um, uh, that FM College. And, and it was about, it was a survey. It was a survey done by a research from Watco, which is a manufacturer. 
and supplier of high performance industrial strength paint repair and maintenance materials. But this was an FM. So it's, it's an FM survey. It's not specific to healthcare. But they found that almost one in three facilities management professionals are making mistakes due to unmanageable workloads. What are your thoughts on that? As we talk about filling the pipeline, and Jordan, we talked about your hiring approach. Is that is that concern is that a concerning trend, or is it, is it something you're seeing? What are your thoughts on that's a high number, right? Thirty three percent. Any thoughts on that? And is that where we're headed or can that be reversed? I'm not trying to be, you know, the sky is falling, hide under the desk, but what are your, as you guys are high level, your directors, what do you think of that trend or that survey? I, I can tell you from my experience, it's um, the guys talk about that all the time when we have our, you know, directors meeting, you know, of the overwhelming amount of work they do. Cause I think there's all the shifting priorities, right. You know, the shifting yeah. priorities, both from a, um, you know, a, um, you know, what the CEOs want, you know, what the corporate wants, what needs to get done in the facilities. So I think that, you know, obviously what's going to be most important is what your boss wants, right? <laughs> done. Right, right. And, you know, and I think that may not always be the most important thing done, right? But it is for him or her. Yep. And um, so I think that, I think that they're overwhelmed with shifting priorities, you know, um, increased regulatory, you know, we always say, you know, mandates that aren't funded, right? You know, I've been doing this 30 years. Yeah. So we have mandates that aren't funded, right? So you got to keep doing more with less, you know? And I, I think that um, there's no facility manager that would tell you that even even on an executive level, that they're not, they don't have the manpower to continue to put the um, the efforts or the the time on various things that need to get done properly, you know? And and I think that, that we need to continue to look at our manpower. We don't have the people to fill some of these spots. I mean, I have, a, I have an MEP, you know, position open. That's a well. It's a you know, it's a six-digit position that I haven't been able to fill for six months, eight months. Wow. You know, because you just can't get the people for it. Yeah. And um, it's it's so. What do you do? You can't even get the people. You're overwhelmed and can't even fill the job. Yeah. So I mean, I think we struggle with that every day. I don't know about Jordan and Ryan, but we certainly do. Yeah. What about you guys, Jordan, Ryan? Any? Yeah, I think you know. For me, it's um. I'll, I'll keep it on the on the hospital level. You know, we we have a we have X amount of work to do, right? And we have less resources to get it done. And and how do I how do I quantitate and walk into the CFO's office and say, hey, I've got a hundred fifty, I've got a hundred PMs, but I can only get seventy of them done because you know I don't have enough FTEs. And how do we articulate that? You know, and again, it, it goes back to speaking those languages, right? And yeah. and being able to quantify the work because people don't understand what we do you know they didn't go to engineering school they went to healthcare management school and it's and it's a little bit different right and and so we we need to speak their language in the terms that they're able to understand to say hey this is a compliance thing and you know an unfunded mandate i'm required by cms to do this and and you know my my hvac guy is is you know at 130 percent and so how do i you know, we're going to have air handlers that aren't cleaned. And, and, you know, I can show you the news, I can show you the, the results of what happens when that doesn't take place. And, and that's, and you have to be able to quantify that risk. Now, it still doesn't, it still doesn't always lead to success. But, but I think that's where it starts. I think there's also opportunity um, facilities, you know, people tend to, everything seems to go to them. Um, and things come up quick, and you need to do this and get this done. And, uh, I, I think people also have to learn how to say no in a way that's not saying no, um, and not just be the yes man. I think uh, sometimes yes. everyone's saying yes all the time to a point where they are overwhelming themselves and setting the institution and themselves up for failure. Uh, and instead, I think people need to also learn how to say no, or offer another solution, but also be able to have those conversations and say, this can't be done. Or if this happens, I need this, um. You mean, Ryan, when you get a call at four o'clock to set up for a conference room call and your guys <laughs> left at three and there's nobody left? You mean those calls? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's an easy one. <laughs> that's an easy one, right. Yeah. right. Or, or somebody ordered a desk from Ikea and they want you to put it together. It's like, right. that's not what we do. I can right. give you a quote right. for somebody to come in and do that. But, you know, we pay for maintenance and repairs. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to, uh, Ryan, I'm going to ask you the final question. 
it's because oh you've termed yourself. You gave yourself the title, the young guy. So I'm going to call you the young <laughs> guy. It's yes or no, and you can lie. So it's a yes or no question, and you can lie. Are you happy with your choice of career coming out of Maritime six years ago, five years ago? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. And so follow up relative to um, hitting that younger generation, younger than you. What would you say to a college kid or college student um, relative to if they have an opportunity to take an internship in healthcare, you might be getting paid a little bit less. What would you tell them? What advice would you give them? Yeah, so I, I go back to Maritime twice a year now and speak to some of the facility engineering classes um, for their facility management course. And I speak specifically about healthcare and, and why to get into it. And uh, I mean, for me, it really comes down to kind of trying to convince them or tell them that there's, I think Jordan talked about it, there's purpose to it. Um, yeah. You're not going and just, yeah, you make the place run. But, but I, I truly feel when I come to work that I am helping someone that's going through something horrible. There's cancer patients, there's, there's mm -hmm. people, folks, people die. I mean, we're in a hospital. Everything's yeah. happening. We have peds, we have all this kind of stuff. And I feel like that I'm giving back to that. Um, and for me, at least, it, you know, tell them that it's not all about the money. You can go, you can work somewhere and you can make all the money in the world. But if you don't feel like you're giving back, it's not going to last long. You're going to get sick of the money. Um, and, and you're going to feel like there's no purpose to your job. And, and I think that's what I try to get across to them the most. Excellent. Well, that is a, uh, that is an excellent point to end on. So <laughs> I don't think you could say it any better. I want to thank my three guests, Jordan Smith from Advent Health in Florida, Jim Hogle, Barnabas Health, RWJ Barnabas Health, West Orange, New Jersey, and Ryan Gagnon in Lebanon, New Hampshire for Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Gentlemen, thank you for appearing. I hope we can uh, do this again. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Pete. That's thank fun. You. Thank you, gentlemen. See you guys. And for those of you who tuned in, as always, I thank you. It's Peter Martin, Healthcare Facilities Network. We'll talk to you later. Thank you for watching this episode of the Healthcare Facilities Network. Please give this episode a like, as it really does make a difference in helping to promote the discipline of healthcare facilities management.